I've been a fine art photographer for a long period now. I actually came out of photography per se. Um, I spent a lot of time in commercial photography. 20 odd years of my life was just shooting in commercial photography, photographing, um, yeah, whatever came in through the door, whether it was whether it was models, whether it was fashion, glamour, portraits, jewelry, cars, whatever it was. And I loved every moment of that. But there was a time in my life where that, um, where that, where that time changed and I moved over into fine art photography. And that transition has been a really big learning curve for me. And that's some of the information that I want to share with you tonight. If you're thinking of getting into fine art photography, then this could be just the right place for you to do that. So I'm going to put up the presentation and I'll break away from it uh, at certain points of the discussion. So let's, uh, let's get into fine art uh, or getting into fine art photography. I'm going to start just right from the beginning. And I suppose a lot of you will be able to connect with what I'm about to say. But certainly for me, when I got into photography and as I started to move through photography, it was a very special time in my life. I absolutely loved the whole learning process of, uh, of trying to take better photographs and trying to take technically more proficient photographs. And for me, I suppose the number one thing to why I wanted to, in, in this case, get into photography was that capturing the moment in time. And that was the, the very first time I actually picked up a camera and, and took my first photo of, I actually knew, you know what, this is something that I could possibly do. And at that stage, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So my father was really, really happy that, that I had found something that interests me. And then the whole technical and artistic challenge came along. Technical first for me and artistic later. So on the technical side, there was a, there was a, you know, a long learning curve, which, which took many, many years to get through. And then on the artistic side, even longer. And I'll be prepared to share that journey with you at some certain point when, uh, you know, perhaps we've got, uh, we've got more time to do that. And the appeal of technology was just absolutely wonderful. I just, I loved cameras. I loved the smell of a new camera. I don't know if you guys are like that, but you know, when you open up the box of a new camera, I mean, it's just, you don't even want to use it. It's just, you, it, it's, it's just beautiful. I, I loved owning equipment. I loved having a storeroom full of equipment. And I loved walking through the storeroom and seeing what the equipment looked like. I loved stacking up the lenses and, and polishing or, or cleaning the lenses on a regular basis. This whole photographic thing for me was, a, was an absolute joy and a bliss. And soon exploring and discovering, I suppose, became almost an excuse for my photography. Uh, in other words, let's buy the equipment. Why? Because once I've got the equipment, I'm forced to go out to explore and to discover new things. And that certainly happened. And storytelling was all part of it certainly in the photography days. And, and I know that many of you, I'm sure, are in a, in a photography club or you are active in competition or, or what have you, and you know exactly what I'm talking about here. It's just a beautiful medium to actually work with. And as you prepare to, to get into or look at getting into fine art photography, things are very different. In photography itself, I did find that there was appreci appreciation for everyday life. Certainly with little things like macro photography, being able to get in close to nature and be with a long lens, being able to photograph nature and all of that. It, it had a wonderful appeal and it was creativity and self-expression uh, almost on steroids. I, I, I really, really enjoyed this process. 20, 25 years of commercial photography and competition photography, publications and exhibition work. And at a certain point, that all came to an end. I started to build a portfolio. The portfolio was all about technical. And I realized not only for myself, but my students at that point, that there was something beyond just the technical side of photography. And that's really where we want to pick up this discussion from today. So I want to start talking about, about how we would get into fine art photography and what the steps would be. The six, this, uh, sorry, the seven biggest lessons I learned over 25 years. Now, I must admit, when I put this presentation together, um, this particular part took a while for me to think, what was it, Martin, that you really, if we look back, you, you know, when you start something and you say, well, if I'd only known that, 
if I'd only known that this or that uh, before we actually started this with this wonderful venture, I could have got there a lot quicker. But here's a few of them. And I, and I must also say that I went back and I had a look at some of the very early work I shot. And oh my God, I was so embarrassed. So embarrassed about what I thought was like genius level and it actually isn't. And, uh, and these are the seven, in my opinion, the seven biggest steps that I learned. Number one, light is the secret ingredient in photography. And I'm sure you as photographers, there's so many of you out there that are enjoying photography, you would have to agree. I mean, light can take the most mundane subject and make it into the most beautiful, beautiful impression. And I learned that and I saw that over and over. Something I've applied to my fine art photography today. I also learned the hard way that simplicity is key. Simplicity is key. And I suppose it's got to do with the way we see, humanly speaking. You know, we have a selected peripheral vision. Are we able to sort of blur out information we don't want to cope with, but the camera doesn't. The camera captures everything. And we don't realize that in the beginning of our photography. And we start to put in far too much information. And our, our work is really only interesting to us. And simplicity is what what picks it up. I also noticed, and this also took a while to learn, but shadows point the way in photography. In other words, it's all to do with contrast. Contrast is about exposure in highlights or shadows. And you soon realize that the quality of your light and, and, the, and, and many of the characteristics of your light are only, or, or only shown up in the shadows. I started to learn how to actually work with shadows so that the highlights would then be correct. And then I... <laughs> This also took a while, but um, I, I remember reading um, some of the quotes of Ansel Adams, and he said, if you want to learn how to take a great picture, just learn where to place your camera. I thought it was a very silly comment, but I found out later that it's an incredibly intelligent comment. Where you place the camera makes a difference, and that's what makes things interesting. You soon find out that shooting from eye level is actually boring because we see that all day long. Low camera angles, high camera angles, playing a bit with compression, shooting through things, shooting over things, all became important in trying to tell the story. And I also then realized that at a certain point, building on a portfolio, your artistic vision and your style is far more important than fancy equipment or expensive equipment. So many times I see people getting into photography and they, they're almost embarrassed to say what camera they own. But for many of them, they've got this incredible artistic vision right from the word go, or they're able to draw out something special from within them, and it's got nothing to do with the camera. I also learned that image sharpness is not a law. And I mean this with all, with all respect, because I have came from a commercial photography background where things had to be pin sharp. I tested lenses before I actually, before I put them into, into my system. I made sure that the lens was as sharp as the manufacturer claimed. And, and if it wasn't, it went back. And the first thing I looked at when I put a slide on a light table was sharpness. And I did that for so many years. And I thought it was a law. It's not a law. In art photography, it is not a law at all. Yeah, you have a creative license and you are able to exercise that as you wish, as long as it actually works with what you photograph it. And certainly from chemical darkroom all the way to digital darkroom, I also soon learned that that completes the process. There's so many photographers out there that I see, certainly on our programs that we run, who come in not understanding Photoshop, uh, today in Photoshop, but the early days in the darkroom, but not understanding Photoshop, not understanding how to develop a file properly, not understanding the difference between developing and editing, and you see it holds them back. It holds them back incredibly. There's nobody else that can do this for you but yourself. I learned that early on. So with those lessons, I turned over into or went into, into fine art photography. That is a whole story on its own. And as I said, I don't find even sharing that with you in a, in a, in a forum like this one day. I don't have a problem with that. But we don't have time for that today. But why consider fine art photography? Why would this be something that you may be looking at. 70% of you on the talk this evening are exactly in that position as per your own admission. So why would you consider fine art photography? Now, before I even give you some pointers, I'm going to issue a warning. And the warning is simply this. Fine art photography is not for everybody. And you need to know this. 
if you're the photographer that I just basically discussed earlier, the same photographer that, that I found myself being, and you enjoy the whole photographic process, you enjoy the equipment, you enjoy the technical challenge that comes with it, if that's what gets you going, and if you don't get that little bit of an excitement when you see art photography being shown, and, and uh, well, it may be not for you. There's many people that, that just don't connect with it, and that is fine because there's a beautiful, beautiful world in pure photography as well, a beautiful world. And my advice for you there would be stick to what you want to do. You would know. Chances that you are on this talk this evening means that you're already exploring, so hopefully what are we talking to you about now will have some value to you. So why consider fine art photography then? Well, here's a few pointers. First of all, I know it will free up photographic anxiety. For many photographers, either because they don't understand the basics of photography properly, or they are trying to get a portfolio together that needs to be of a very high standard, or you find that they are competing at a club level, but when they are behind the camera, they're scared of making mistakes. They're scared of losing the moment. They're scared of making mistakes, finding out afterwards. And there's almost this anxiousness that comes with shooting behind the camera. And very often, these photographers follow, follow a whole technical routine, step by step. And that tends to break your, your artistic ability. So fine art photography will break that whether you like it or not. It will free it up whether you like it or not. Secondly, it helps you to explore creative self-expression easily. You know, uh, shooting straight photography, you can do the same. It's just you have to work a lot harder at it. Fine art photography allows you that license of self-expression. You'll be able to experiment beyond the lens, experiment way beyond the lens, because you're going to be able to bring in a whole lot of different influences into your photography that you may not have known is possible. It's also going to, it's a rapid development of an artistic voice, sometimes almost too rapid. I find that a lot of my students who come on my art programs as they progress have to take a break eventually because, because the techniques are one after the other and they need time to digest it and time to work through it. And the development is very quick and the artistic voice comes out really quickly and then eventually a style will follow. Fine art photography is also going to offer you this, the tools to evoke emotion. So what is fine art photography? You saw on the definition I put up earlier, fine art photography is an expression of the artist. It's what you want to say. So you already are an artist. You pick up a camera and you're in fine art photography, you are an artist. Now you need to express yourself. Well, you're going to need to express yourself through emotion. There's two levels to, to fine art photography. Just on the other side, you've got art photography, which is more decorative. Well, there, there's no emotion. Their technique can still be used, but when it comes to fine art photography, it's deeper. Fine art photography, as I've said in my last presentation, is where you, you, you tend to, to come in contact with it in a gallery environment. That's where you usually come in contact with it, or it is in a publication or a book or something like that. Art photography is, is, is a little bit different. Art photography is more decorative. You'll find that in hotel rooms and boardrooms and things like that. So you get the tools to be able to do it, but also you'll be able to evoke that emotion. And from there, exhibition and recognition follows on if you prepare to walk the road and stick it out. But the big thing for me is the joy of creating. I think that's the big thing. Why do you consider fine art photography? It is the joy of creating. It's that wonderful space you find. It's the joy of creating. So. I don't know about you, but in today's world, certainly in the recent times, the noise of the world is incredibly high. I don't know if you experience the same, and it just doesn't keep quiet. And we tend to find ourselves uh, even busier than we ever were before. And there's just not that space for us to be able to relax creatively. One of the big reasons to get into art photography and fine art photography, even if it's not for exhibiting or it's not for putting work up on a wall or for decorative purposes, even if it's got nothing to do with that, the one thing that is probably more important than both of those 
is for our own sanity. And I don't know what I would do if you took that gift away from me. When I want to find sanity, I just need to find the studio, the camera, or I need to go out and photograph. And that for me is one of the main reasons why many people should or consider to get into fine art photography. Man, you've evolved in photography and you know, depending on where you live, or depending on your circumstances, it's not that easy just to, just to pick up a camera and go off and shoot, especially on your own with expensive equipment. I mean, it's, you know, it's just not that easy. With fine art photography, it's merely just opening up the studio door and continuing. And that makes the difference. So it gives you a lot more place to actually practice. So the joy of creating for me is probably the most important. So Graham says over here that he's a technical photographer and he says that I admire the arty type of work you guys do. So thank you, Graham. I appreciate that very much. And it says, I'm not an artist at all. Well, my question is going to be, how do you know that? But all right, by your own admission, you're not an artist at all. That's fine. And then he says, do you think I'll be wasting my time pursuing fine art photography? Well, Graham, I think, uh, no, you won't. I'm going to let uh, Mr. Pablo Picasso answer you because, you know, for all the time that I have taught art photography and fine art photography, I have never, ever had a student who could not complete a program, a task, because they were not skilled to do so artistically. There is an artist in every person. Some people have more of an artistic uh, interpretation and others don't but it's something that can be taught. Picasso by his own admission says every child is an artist. The problem is how we remain yeah, how we remain a child once we grow up, how that artist remains and that is so true. That is so true and that comes from one of the most prolific and well-known artists that ever walked this planet. Another question that came in had to be anonymous because it's quite a tough question. It says that my limited understanding of fine art photography is that you just need to be a whiz at Photoshop. Now I can already see the giggles stopping. <laughs> yeah, that's all you need is Photoshop. How many times have I had this come through? So anonymous, thank you very much. We're well aware of this. Yes, you are right that for a lot of people and a lot of the public, when you talk photography and you talk Photoshop, those are usually, Photoshop is a manipulated word. And for many people, when they see something creative, they first ask, was it done in Photoshop? Well, anonymous, Photoshop is part of the journey. So from film photography all the way through to pure photography, digital, um, and then into the art medium itself, which we'll talk about in a moment. Well, Photoshop is part of that whole journey. Photoshop is a beautiful tool and can be used to do very, very interesting and expressive things with our work. We actually couldn't do without it, but we only use it for certain things. We only need it here and there. We need it for processing. We need it for basic editing. But most of the time, we create by hand. So it is part of the journey, but it's not the journey itself. Getting into fine art photography requires a mind shift. And I think it's because for many of us, we're coming out of pure photography where we have to control everything as precise as possible. The exposure has got to be right. The, the light has got to be right. The, the, the composition has got to be right. The sharpness has got to be right. There's this whole control that goes through. And then, of course, there's a whole minefield of developing and editing. And to move over into a mindset of art photography requires quite a big leap. Now, if you were attended my last talk, I, um, I put up this slide and I'm going to do it now because I think it's pertinent at this point. But there is such a big difference between technical photography and artistic interpretation. So the difference between photography and art is quite profound. If you look at photography, it's all about precision. I went through this whole journey where everything was about precision and everything is, even today, every camera that comes out is better quality. Lenses are better. Everything is better. Everything's about upgrading. Art is not. Art is about impression. Everything about photography is crisp and smooth in that sense, whereas in, 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 in art, it's about texture and grunge. 
in photography, it's natural colors and trying to get the correct color. Photogra uh, art itself looks beautiful in unnatural color, exaggerated color, and even in the wrong color. Photography is photorealistic, and in most often art is abstract. It's again very different. Photography deals with realism, whereas art deals with fiction. These are two completely different um, interpretations when it comes to artistic, uh, art artistic input. Photography is historic and art is timeless. Now, for many of you, as you want to get into fine art photography, you are going to have to cross this boundary line. And do you know where most people go wrong? Most of the time is they don't cross the boundary line properly. So it's like the fence is there, but they get onto the fence with one foot on the other side. And the moment you fence sit in this game, your work is terrible. You either have to adopt it and accept it, or you must rather stay away from it. Your camera becomes one of the instruments on the workbench of art. It's only one of the instruments you are going to turn to to be able to create art. There's many other instruments in, uh, you are going to be using. So what value does photography then add to creating art? There's a good question. Why is it that I should go into fine art photography? Why shouldn't I just go and consider putting my camera aside and going into art? How's that for a question? Well, what we are failing to see is that the camera brings some beautiful benefits to it. So those of you who've just joined us on this, this talk this evening, who are wanting to get into photography as maybe an option to develop your art skills that you already have, this is why you would want the camera. First of all, it's a perfect recording device. It records absolutely perfectly. It can also draw. So for many people who can't draw, the camera can. And then there's all the other things that photography brings to it. Freezing motion, blurring motion, multiple exposures, which is again a beautiful artistic expression that you can do in camera. It can record out of focus. <laughs> there was a time in my career that I would say, why would you ever want to record out of focus? Now today, I sometimes ask the opposite question. Even the great Ansel Adams said, if there's one thing he hates more than anything else, it is a sharp picture of a fuzzy concept. So even him, who was a stickler for sharpness, was already questioning that. Your camera can distort beautifully based on your lenses. It can compress beautifully based on your lenses. It can bring in contrast like you have never seen before. In fact, the camera can over amplify contrast if that's what you're looking for. And on top of that, it can disguise things in highlights and shadows. So you can use it for that benefit too. It comes with grain and noise if you choose to use it. And of course, you can lighten and darken based on exposure. Plus the fact it's a wonderful enlarging tool. When you create a piece of art, you can photograph it properly and blow it up to any size that you want and create an art piece on the wall of note. It is a marvelous piece of equipment if used in combination in fine art photography. Andy says, is fine art photography a relatively new concept? And why are some, sorry, and what are some of the challenges that fine art photographers face? Well, Andy, there's two questions in there, and both of them are quite interesting. In your question, is fine art photography relatively a new concept? Well, no. In the, in, in, in the whole picture of art, absolutely not. I mean, art dates way back. But then you must remember that photography is a new kid on the block when it comes to art. So it's not that old. But if we talk about the 1800s, well, maybe that's old enough for you. And here in the 1800s, 1890 all the way through to 1940, already in the pre, pre days of photography, we saw that an art movement was already established. The pictorial art movement or pictorialism art movement was established um, purely to elevate photography to a level of fine art. There was already photographic artists who could see that they wanted to use the camera more to express an artistic impression and not just a technical one. And that was the goal. And Soft focus uh, was probably one of the big techniques they used. So they didn't say out of focus. They just called it soft focus. And very often that softening was done in the printing process in the, under the enlarger where they would soften it using, using a different medium. One of them, by the way, uh, 
in later days was hairspray, hairspray on glass. You spray some hairspray on glass in the darkroom and you put that under your lens and you get this beautiful soft focus effect. Um, the other was darkroom uh, manipulation and the other was alternative processes of printing to create an artistic or painterly expression. And this whole movement was purely to move away from uh, pure technical photography. Have a look at some of the some of the art that was created in in um, in in this movement. So Alfred Stick lives here. You can see this is he's a great great art impression. It's the Net Mender. This was this was published in 1894, taken and created in 1894. You can see the softness on the actual image, and you can see that it can it feels like a monochrome painting. If you look at, uh, at, at, at Station over here, Edward J. Station, you will see that this art impression of his, of his, also through the same movement, 1910, is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I, I think this is just an outstanding piece of photographic art uh, based on, on my pure opinion. We then move into the 1970s. We're now looking at, uh, you know, at, at the Andy Warhol, uh, the, the greatest pop art photographer, actually one of the greatest artists that's ever ever lived. And, uh, and when he was introduced to Polaroid, he found a whole new tool that he was using. This was his Polaroid series that he was working on, and you would see that there's some great, uh, there's some great celebrities that he photographed in that time. I mean, uh, I don't have my glasses on, but I know John Lennon is there. I know that Grace Jones is there. I know that Debbie Harry from Blondie is there. One of the, one of the, um, you know, she he created some absolutely stunning pop artwork of of Debbie Harry during his time. Even uh, Muhammad Ali is there. So. He, he was using the Polaroid as a capture device in order to then take his painting further. We'll hear a little bit more from, from Andy Warhol a little bit later on. But moving on, 18, uh, 1984, still looking at the question, you know, is this a relatively new concept? No, it's not. It's been with photography all the time. It's been with photography all the time, met with, with, uh, with harsh criticism, yes, but it's been there. Jan Saudek, great, great, great fine art photographer. A little bit controversial, but great nevertheless. Um, this particular piece is a black and white photograph printed in the darkroom and hand painted with photographic oils and dyes. What a talent. Absolutely beautiful. And even later than that, we look at the work of Robert uh, Rushenberg, and yeah, you can see this is the Bleacher series that he, that he used using Polaroids. It's called the Japanese Sky 1988. This particular series was treated with household bleach in order to get this look. <laughs> I can see a couple of the guys laughing already because that's one of the techniques we also use during our art classes. So, um, yeah, now you pretty much know where we get the influence from. What is also quite astounding, uh, based on your question, this group that was founded in the early, early 1800s to break away from technical photography suddenly we find that, that another group is formed in order to counteract them. Now, doesn't, isn't that crazy? Isn't that absolutely crazy how we as photographers can stand our ground on a certain opinion? So if we go back to the presentation, have a look at this. So we're going right back here now to what uh, uh, the 1920s, 1930s. A photography movement or group was started called straight photography. So no longer impressionism, no longer pictorial, but straight photography. The movement is known as the F64s. You may have heard of them. F64 because exceptionally deep depth of field and nice sharp images. And guess who was part of this group? This group was about precision of the medium, focusing needs to be sharp and in detail, accurate representation, technical mastery. Completely different to what we just saw previous to that. And guess who was part of this? The great Ansel Adams, Edward Weston was part of this, even Imogen Cunningham was part of this. And uh, what I also found quite funny is that sometimes we can make a stand, but we're not really making a stand. So if you look at Edward Weston, <laughs> this is his, his, his very, very famous um, art photograph, um, that, or fine art photograph that, that he took called Shells. This was 1927. This was in the F64 style. This was super sharp, good contrast, excellent printing, 
detail where it needs to be. Even Ansel Adams would have given him the nod and said, you got it. But we take a step back and we find Edward Weston, nine years previously, in the pictorialist style with a figure of the nude, 1918. So sometimes you find that there is beautiful life on both sides of the fence and we can use both of them. The challenges in your question that you had, your challenges is, uh, you asked what are the challenges that face fine art photographers? Well, I think there's a difference over here. I'm going to give you the challenges that face professional fine art photography where it's based on the living. But I think uh, there is a challenge, I'm just going to switch that up, but there's also a challenge for a fine art photographer who's not practicing professionally. So perhaps somebody who's at a, a club level, for example, or, a, you know, sort of practicing on their own just for the joy of it. I think the moment they get into competition, there's a challenge. And any of you who belong to a photographic club or a photographic movement where you have judges coming to judge your work, you would know that for most of, uh, of the time that by putting up an artistic impression in front of a judge is sometimes a bit unfair. Not unfair to, unfair to you, yes, because you're, whatever you're going to get back as feedback is, is probably not what you want to hear because the judge is, 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 is not in a position to give you feedback. And that happens, so I understand that. So maybe that's a challenge that we have, and it's unfair to the judge as well to go and put something that's really artistic and really out there and put it up and say, what do you think of that? And yet the club itself is probably specializing in landscape photography or wildlife photography. So there's a challenge that, that exists in that space. More and more clubs I see today are opening up a fine art photography or art photography category and trying to be a little bit more cohesive with, with the actual, you know, with the actual movement. But, but for, that would be a challenge. But let's have a look at the challenges that, that face the professional photographer. So the professional fine art photographer, and here I can speak from experience, I can tell you that these are all exactly what we face every day. The, the first one, I'm going to put it right up at the top because this has just turned up into our arena. That's artificial intelligence. You, I've got the whole article you can go and read if you like to. But certainly it's going to offer us not only challenges in a negative way, but I actually think it's going to offer us some beautiful stuff in a positive way. I think if you, if you, if you look at using artificial intelligence as part of your workflow to be able to create an idea and bring it to the front and then take that and create something physically, I think you're in a good space. And I don't think there's any way artificial intelligence is going to be able to overtake the, uh, the, the handcrafted human art. So it's there, but we will have to deal with it one way or the other. Second thing is conceptualizing before creating. It's one of the big ones that, and many of you here this evening have been on some of my art classes and I can see you already nodding. But it's to be able to not just go to a shoebox and dig out some photographs and then try to put a technique onto it and see what it comes out like, but it's conceptualizing an idea and then going and creating around that idea. That is a challenge. Certainly for me and Samantha, we do a lot of exhibiting. We have to conceptualize the exhibit before we create the art. And that is a big challenge in our lives. Artistic block is another one. There's sometimes this whole medium seems so difficult, so incredibly difficult. It feels like you're walking into a, into a brick wall and it feels so hard. And on other days, it feels so easy. It's like all other forms of creativity, I guess. And there's always that thing of stagnation that you have to watch out, that you're continually trying and testing things. I suppose one of the other things that I would say is that um, being in the fine art photography realm as a professional fine art photographer, well, the emotional roller coaster ride is high. You come off an exhibition, the exhibition is a great success, uh, everything works well, and the, and, and the roller coaster is really going. And then you find on the other side that three weeks later, Everything has died down, everything is quiet, and now you're trying to figure out what to do next, and uh, it's a different feeling altogether. So I suppose that's something we have to go to. And then the big one I would put, you know, you ask the question, I'm going to give you the answer here, but I think as a fine art photographer, you soon realize that people buy from people. People buy from people, and, and people follow people, and that's being able to grow and keep an audience interested in your work. That's quite a big challenge. It's quite a big challenge. There's one thing about putting your work online and saying it's available. It's another thing engaging with an audience, and it's a quite a difficult thing to do. So those are the challenges that I would certainly bring up this evening. And you'll notice that 
as we get into uh, photography, into art, you can go back to the recording I've done before. But here you can see that, that you have to have this outward thinking that in order to create art, the, the idea comes and then you start looking for the different mediums you can use in order to bring it forward using photography as a base. So let's go and have a look at some creative techniques. Now, uh, I, I can keep you busy with this all night. I'm not. I'm going to go through this quite quickly. But I've got some nice examples to show you here. And maybe this will give you some idea of what I'm talking about. Most of the examples I'm going to show you are from students of mine who are either currently on the programs or have just finished some of the programs. So, and I wish I could show you everybody's work, but I just can't. So let's have a look. Now, you're going to see that I'm going to mention these as we go through. But there's a whole lot of techniques that will come up. Some of them we will cover this evening, others we won't. But to create fine art for photography with the camera as part of the process, these are the certain techniques you can look at getting into. The first is collaging and photomontaging. I'll show you some examples of that. Hand-painted photographs, you've already seen Jan Saudek's work, which is so beautiful, but hand-painted or hand-drawn elements on photography is another avenue that you can pursue. Textured overlays and encaustic medium. I'm going to show you one or two great examples this evening, which are just beautiful, both textured uh, overlays, which is textures that is put onto the photograph and then re-photographed, or encaustic medium, which is then painted onto the photograph to bring the photograph to life. Alternative printing methods, transfers also can be used. Many of us remember the old Polaroid transfers, which was a beautiful part of art. You may remember all of that. Well, there's other ways of doing it as well. Today, we don't have the Polaroids anymore, but we have other ways of doing that. Alternative printing methods comes into this as well, and that includes cyanotype printing and all those other master type printers, print, printing uh, mediums of the past. Incorporating physical objects into your photography can also help to uplift it into art photography and fine art photography. Physical objects, and I'll show you that in a moment. Multiple exposure techniques in the camera, beautiful medium for creating fine art photography, and you don't even have to buy any more equipment for that. You already have it. Most of the cameras that you have today have got multiple exposure facilities, and you can use that to create beautiful pieces. Photography through different mediums, easy to do. Easy to do. You can photograph through things like frosted glass or through strict plastics. or, or um, I've even gone and burned some of my old lenses, my plastic lenses, so I could photograph through a burnt buckled piece of lens. Well, that works, but then you end up with a bad lens. But that, Instead of doing that, you can do other things. But photographing through different mediums. And then, of course, digital editing and compositing, which is another skill all on its own. But for some of you, you may be highly skilled at Photoshop. It's another way of being able to create beautiful art pieces. Have a look at some of these. Now, one or two of these I showed on the last presentation, but I'm going to show them again because I know we've got a whole lot of new people this evening. Over here, we've got um, one of Eddie's photographs. Now, the reason I'm showing this, this is a photo montage, but have a look at the original. The original is, and Eddie, I don't mean this with any disrespect, but I spoke to you about this when we got in the class because it was so fascinating that you took something that is almost a throwaway image that you might have taken in error that you've gone and taken and you've turned this into something which you can actually look at and enjoy. And it's purely through the photo montage process itself. And by the way, this is a physical montage. This is not something you create in Photoshop. This is something you create by hand. Here you can see this is a, one of Renee's uh, beautiful images over here. And this is crystal overlay. So this is what a crystal overlay does for you. The original photograph on the left transforms into this absolute artistic impression. It looks as if it's been painted uh, with, with, uh, as a pointillism effect. And uh, yeah, it's lost all of its, 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 its heavy contrast and color, and it's gone into this soft tone powdery medium. Very beautiful. It's one of Leslie's uh, pieces that, uh, that Leslie has done. And here she has used distortion to, um, yeah, to a large degree. So using distortion and then text overlays and a whole lot of other things which Leslie probably wouldn't want to share with us. But uh, you can see that the actual impression is interesting now some of you might look at this and say but i would never want to do that to my photography well that's because you're looking at it maybe through a photographer's eye but when you look at it from an artist's uh, point of view or you look at it from an art collector's point of view 
that could be very, very, very beautiful and, and, and very um, admirable. So it depends, but it's interesting. And then uh, this is one of Craig's, uh, Craig's work. Craig, I think, is with us this evening. I saw him earlier on. Um, so this is one of Craig's pieces, and this is a photo collage that he put together. I did send him a message today to say, Craig, I want to show this picture. Is, is it, uh, it's, it's just, it is a photo collage, right? Well, he mentioned a whole lot of other steps which I didn't put in because it would have just taken up the whole left-hand side of the page, and then my design would have been really bad. So, uh, Craig, forgive me, but I'm going with the main technique here, which is the photo collage. Um, there's another um, beautiful little set of images. You know, if I showed you these and I never said to you photography, you, you would battle to even know that photography is part of this process. This is Sally Thompson's work. Sally's out in the USA. And Sally, uh, I asked her today if she could send the originals of this. She couldn't because she's on the road and she hasn't got a computer with her. But just enjoy it for what it is. Uh, it's a series of transfers and she's treated it in all different ways based on the techniques that we have been working through. This is Samantha. Samantha, my daughter's work, who's sitting next to me over here. Um, her work is not anywhere near as good as mine. I just want to let you know that right away. So those of you who are fresh and new to this, you must just understand that, yeah, that whatever you see now that she puts up, mine is 10 times better. There's a lot of competition that goes along in this little creative space. But have a look at the piece that she started with on the left. And this is an ink transfer that was done onto metal, onto aluminium. And then she used acrylic paint to embellish it. And she used gold leaf to put onto it. Uh, this was part of an exhibition we had uh, early in the year, and she created three stunning pieces. They look like Japanese art. Absolutely beautiful. The same time she did uh, the, the exhibition just prior to that, she did this collection called Memoirs, uh, Memoirs of Nature, if I remember correctly. And this is an image transfer as well, but it's also got what is known as a black powder transfer onto it, and she's painted acrylic over the top. So you can see how the photograph now becomes part of the process. There's many artists out there who use photography as their source of reference in any case. Uh, in this case, it's used not only as a source of reference, but it's actually used as a layer in creating the art. I also showed this piece of Petra's uh, at, the last, uh, at the last presentation. I'm going to show it again because it's got two things that are quite pertinent here. The first is the encaustic medium, which brings the texture to it. The second thing is a physical 3D overlay. So that's the cotton that's been added physically over the top of the actual artwork, and it creates, again, a beautiful depth to the actual piece. Compare the original to the actual artwork. It's quite, uh, it, it's quite stunning. And then uh, Mark, I think Mark is with us this evening as well. Um, Mark, uh, we asked him to if we could just put this up this evening, and we asked him if he could send us the original. The original he did as an in-camera movement, so you can see that on the left. But then he went forward and used encaustic medium with it. And you can see how it's toned the highlights down beautifully. And I wish you could see this close up because the textures are just phenomenal on the encaustic medium part. So again, a beautiful, beautiful art impression that was created. Um, those of you who are keen on nature photography, wildlife photography, that sort of thing, you can also, in your fine art photography, you can turn your work into something really spectacular. Here you would see that uh, Deborah has gone and using hand painting and then texture has created this. Again, if you look at it, you would feel like it's a realistic painting that has been done. Phenomenal coloring that's been brought into it now using photographic, uh, uh, using the photographic medium as a source, but then using your paints and so on to be able to tone and bring it to life. Um, yeah, I think Johan is with us as well this evening. Uh, Johan is out in Orange County in the USA. He's currently on a program with me at the moment. I didn't, uh, I didn't see him flash by, but I'm sure he's with us. And he just recently, a few weeks ago, has created these beautiful, colorful photo collages. Again, you would almost not know that the camera was involved, except for the fact that uh, it's photorealistic, but it is really very, very beautiful. Earlier in... Um, Oh, late last year, I think it was, we had a, a student exhibition and this uh, Mike put together and uh, have a look at what the original looks like. And Mike, I think I said to you right in the beginning that your original is actually quite a good photograph in any case. 
and I wanted to know why you would be wanting to fiddle with that in the first place. Well, you fiddled beautifully and have a look at just how beautiful this impression has now come through and come out. So this is texture overlays and I would be lying to you if I told you what he used or how he used it because I don't even think Mike knows what he's actually done. Um, your physical texture overlays, this is one of my pieces, as you can see, far better than Samantha's. A lot more depth, a lot more color, a lot more interest. Um, you can see there that a physical overlay has been used. In this case, rubber bands have been used to bring the photographic part through, but then the background is hand-painted into, into color, and the two tend to work quite well together. This is another piece that, uh, that uh, got quite a popular um, reception at one of the except, uh, at one of the exhibitions. This is using uh, painting. So this is this is painting. This is fluid painting used with photography as again as a medium, and then scratches to bring the actual piece uh, the textures back to the piece. You will notice just under her um, it's her left eye, and also just on her lips, there's a little bit of glistening. That's actually glycerine. That is uh, liquid glycerine that's been added to give that sort of. This is multiple camera in uh, multiple exposures in camera, and you can see in this case I think it's about eight exposures all on top of each other, and you can see just how beautiful you can create really interesting pieces in camera without having to even go into a studio to create art. Last two questions I'm going to deal with, and then we're going to be taking our break. The one question over here is how can I effectively market and promote my fine art photography? That's from Cell. So this is a question all on its own. And if there's enough interest on this, I'd happily do the same presentation for a group on, on this. There was a few people who asked this question about marketing their photography and promoting their photography and approaching galleries. It's not for this evening, so Sal, so we'll get back. I'll, I'll try to do that with, a, with an audience if there's, enough, uh, if there's enough interest in it. But the question I found very interesting, probably the most interesting of everything this evening is from Hank. And Hank says, how do I go about developing my own unique style in fine art photography? Samantha had to laugh because I said to her, well, geez, if I had the answer to that, I'd be there already. I think it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer, Hank. But I'm going to give you some advice based on the walk that I've already had. So, Hank, think of this as your to-do list. So, think of this as your to-do list. So, here we go. This is what I would suggest you do if you are keen on getting into fine art photography and you want to develop a style and you want to take it further. First of all, identify artists you can connect with. This doesn't have to be photography artists. This can be any artist. Yeah, I've got four mentors in my life. All of them are dead. Two are artists and two are photographers. So it doesn't matter who you're following or who you're using. That's not important, but identify what you really like. Once you've identified these artists that you connect with, research everything that you need to know about them, the motivation, the style, the techniques they use, and the subject choices. The internet is a wonderful source of, in of, of information, and research it and try to figure it out. Then note down, out of all of those artists, what is the positive aspects that you admire the most about what they do? You're soon going to find that even if you have a mentor that you enjoy, you're not going to enjoy all the work that that artist has created. You're going to enjoy some of it. And some of the work you are not only going to enjoy, but you're going to enjoy certain aspects of it. It might be the color, it might be the texture, it might be the approach, whatever it is. Jot those positive aspects down and put that whole lot together. So now you've got two or three or four artists with positive aspects that you are finding that you actually enjoy. Take all of that and start to emulate the aspects that you appreciate. Now, this is important. Do not directly copy. I want you to hear me carefully here. Do not try to take a piece and copy it to see how well you can get there. That's not going to get you there. You've got to find your own voice. So you've got to take the aspects that you enjoy and then work around that. Secondly, never present, publish, or exhibit similar work. If your work is too close to the mentor that you are using, then don't put it out there. You will always be compared to that mentor. Stay away from that. It's a dangerous territory. Rather, the aspects of what that mentor does for you. There's a wonderful book called Stealing Like an Artist, or Steal Like an Artist, and if you can get hold of that, read it, you will understand what I'm talking about now. Now, 
practice and refine your techniques that resonate with you and practice and practice. And when you think you've practiced enough, practice some more. Explore artistic impressions, expressions beyond photography by pushing the boundaries. And here you can really look at your photography and say, well, I used to be, I used to work with, with sharp focus. What happens if, uh, if it isn't? I used to work with correct color. What happens if it isn't? I used to work with smooth texture. What happens if I add texture? What happens if I do throw in uh, proportion or distortion? What does it look like? Explore those boundaries and keep an open mind. And then try, where possible, at a certain point to conceptualize before you create. That's the hard boundary. You got the skill, you got the ideas, you got, you got sort of the vision, but now what are you going to create? You conceptualize before you actually start. Then I would seek feedback, not from friends, not from family, not from photographers. Let me say it again. Not from friends, not from family, and not from photographers. Go and seek feedback from art curators, gallery directors, or established fine art or art photographers or artists per se. And then keep an open mind when you hear what is being said. Keep an open mind to constructive criticism. Remember that the artistic journey, Hank, is a continuous journey. It starts from the day you decide and it will continue and continue and you'll get better and better and better at it as you practice. It is a, it's, not a, it's not a sprint. You're not going to just become a fine art photographer overnight. It's going to take a walk and it's a beautiful walk. It's an exciting walk. It's an exciting journey and you need to be prepared for that. And then you can push the boundaries of artistic elements and embrace ongoing development in different techniques and different equipment. Hank, that's my to-do list for you this evening. And I'm going to end off with this this evening with a great quote by the great Andy Wall. Seen we, we spoke about him earlier. If you were to ask him the same question, he would simply say, don't think about making art, Hank. Just get it done. And then he would go on to say, let everybody decide whether it's good or bad. And then let them decide whether they hate it or love it. And while they're deciding, make even more art. And that's what I will leave you with this evening on this topic before we go to questions and answers. I'm speaking to you tonight from the, uh, from the gallery. This is the gallery on our, on our property. This is where we exhibit. This is our holy grail. I'm speaking to you from, uh, from the basement gallery down below the main gallery. If ever you are in Cape Town and you do not come and visit, we will find out. So you must come and visit and see what we do. There's a big difference between what you see on the wall and what you see on a website. I encourage you to come and do that. If you have interesting topics that you would like, to, uh, would like us to address in the world of art photography and fine art photography, please send those suggestions through as well. If there's a need, I would be happy to sit and discuss it. If I don't, Sam will do it for you because obviously she's a far better photographer and an art, an artist than I. So there we go. May you have a wonderful evening further. Go and get yourself a glass of your favorite beverage. Sit back and relax and enjoy the rest of the day or the evening. God bless you, everybody.